Uh, Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 10, and I'll read those again, starting from verse 10, just for we can catch up a bit. And I'm on chapter 1, so that wouldn't work. Chapter 2, the book of Philippians, verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not just not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son, his father, as with... Yeah, let's check that out again. That as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. There we go. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord, with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. Pretty soon I'm going to need glasses to start reading. I think pastor's got like three pairs under here, so we're good, but it's getting there. The lights are going dim. Horrible, but that's how it goes when you're almost 70, so. Anyway, I look good for 70, huh? Just kidding. Anyway, verse 10, it says that of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And then where we left off in, uh, on Sunday, verse 9, it says, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. So now we see that that name Jesus, Lord, Yahweh, God, we'd already established that on Sunday, that he is God, right? So that at that name, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it says every knee, right? That means all, right? In the Greek, that's what it means, all means all, will submit and and acknowledge his lordship. So, going to come a time, whether you're for him or against him, every knee, heaven, earth, under the earth, those who are there, everyone will stand before the Lord. You know, those resurrected to judgment, those of us are going to heaven, that all those, and even heaven falls down and bows before him. Why? Because he's God. He is the eternal being. He is the almighty. So everyone will submit and acknowledge the lordship of him, right? Some to salvation, some to judgment. Much easier if you go the first way, first route, right? Those who know him, those who 
have given our lives over to him, though to ask for forgiveness of our sins, acknowledge that, we go to different judgment. What, what we've done, what, what's going on with our life down here, what we've done for the Lord, boom, enter in, good and faithful servant. The other ones, not such a nice judgment. Judgment to eternal separation. That would be hell. That's pretty heavy, you know, that easy now, but there'll become a time when all judgment that you don't, people hate that name, Jesus, Jesus Christ, God, ugh, get that away from me. Why? Because it brings guilt. It brings that, ugh, I've done something wrong. We have that sin. It brings it to light that people want to be able to do whatever they want to do and not face that judgment, but that's what that name means. That's what we represent as believers, that Jesus Christ, we, that, that light, that goodness, that's what is represented. And that name is just, that's a, just, mm, that's what, when we're not for him, we had enmity with God. It means a deep hatred for him. I never thought that before. When I, when I wasn't a believer, I never thought, man, I hate God. I hate Jesus. I was, I was brought up Catholic and communion and all that kind of stuff. I wasn't an altar boy. I didn't get that far. They didn't even ask me, so. But, you know, I just never considered it a normal person, just, oh, I really hate God. No, you thought, hey, I'm, you know, pretty good person. I'm going to heaven. I'll probably be there. You know, I'm going to do what I want to do, but never thought of myself as a hater of Jesus Christ. But it's what it says, either for me or against me. You know, and at enmity with God is that's what it means, a deep hatred for him. Because, hey, it points to what? Right to the heart, you know? His word, his name, it just cuts right to the heart. Like, oh, man. Just think when you're, if you've ever backslidden, none of you have, I know, because you're all perfect. But I walked away from the Lord for like nine years and just did my own thing, you know? And uh, you don't think, wow, man, you're just running from him, that you just have that, I don't want to do it. I don't, want to, I don't want to follow him, you know. But at this point, it's saying every knee will bow. Earth, heaven, under the earth, they all will. And confess that Jesus is Lord, you know. Easy right now. We're following him. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We can say that. Those who aren't, they will one day. You know, that decision that they're going to either accept him or not, going to come to a point where there's, you don't have that choice anymore. It's done. It's over. We had that time, and it could be soon. Anytime, like I taught last Wednesday, remember about the labor pains, the ladies, and all that stuff? We'll get back into that, because I got a lot of bad comments on that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> about my knowledge of birth giving, but the same thing. As we see these days are getting closer and closer, and the, and the, and the birth pains are getting stronger and, and closer together, we see that it's going to come a point that's it. No more chance now. No more choice. It's, it's over. You know, it's going to be that time where the church is raptured up. We have tribulations going on. For those who believe, that time is going to cost them their lives. And then into ultimate judgment after that. So the day is coming quickly for those who don't know him. It's time. It's time to repent. We're sinners. No man is good. We're all sinners. We're all sinners, except we've been saved by grace. We've been forgiven. Uh, Isaiah 45, 22 to 23 says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I love that. Like, look to me to be saved. I am God. There is no other. Right there, if Jesus is God, if everyone, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess to Jesus as Lord then he must be God. It's right there. Only going to be look to God and be saved. For I am God and there is no other. Same. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. So, the same. That's coming. So, in, in, in we saw last week, or, yeah, Sunday, and today, that Paul is reminding us this far 
almost midway through the chapter of why we're here, what we're to be about. You know, be of that earlier on the chapter would be of that, that mind, the mind of Christ, that one mindedness, be of one accord. I won't bring up the civic joke. And then everyone's in that same mind frame. Be in the mind of Christ. Be that bond servant. So he's reminding us of that, of, of why we're here, what we're about, and pressing forward to, the, to bring the gospel. Continue on to follow the Lord's example that he came as a man in humility, leaving the throne in obedience to the Father, even to the cross. And that he's also, Paul, writing through this to equip us, equip them at that time, for current, what we're going through, and future hardships. Like I said before, we are going to go through those things. They persecuted him, they will persecute us. They hated him, they're going to hate us. Can't see it right now. It's pretty, everyone loves the church and Christians right now. But So, one day it will come. So, he he's just equips us for that, you know, through this part in there. And then resting also in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and that He is our hope, and our hope is what him coming back for the church and our eternal life with him in heaven, right? So in verse 12, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So he's saying, follow after the things of Christ, Be in obedience to those things, the things of Christ that we're obedient in. These things that Paul had taught them when he was there. You know, through his journeys, he got there a couple times through the letters, teaching them, equipping them, giving them what? The way, the word, right? Working out those things. Everything that the Holy Spirit has has taught Paul, that he is pouring out those things, letting him know, letting us know who Christ is, who Christ is. Is, is coming and all that. Uh, to be firm in the salvation. Be firm in your salvation. Know your salvation. Right? We, we've been saved uh, in a, to a relationship with the Lord. Not a religion, not a crutch. I love when people say that. It's a relationship with him. You know, to have a love for one another. A love for the lost. You know, you can tell the love we have because... People are all sitting close together. We love on everybody. People way in the back there. You're going to spend eternity with each other. Be close. Get close. Next time I teach, everyone's sitting together. Shoulder to shoulder. (laughs) Maybe even holding hands. Try it. But anyway, yeah. That love for one another, as Christ had, you know, and still has. He looks down on the sinner, and he loves them. He looked down on us while we were a sinner. He loves us. It's the sin that separates us from him, but he has that love. So we should have that love for one another, and we should have that heart like Paul did for the lost. You know, what did he say? That his countrymen, that he would even give up his own salvation so that he could see them saved? That's pretty heavy right there. I'm not giving up none of mine for nobody. But that's where his heart was, and he didn't, you know, of course he didn't mean it, but his heart was for, hey, that's how deep a love he had for his people, for the lost, like we should have. Sometimes we want that they would just fall off the end of the earth, be easier, but no, you know, they're they're not our enemy. People are blinded, they're without the knowledge of Christ. So we shouldn't hate them. God said, love your enemy. That's not easy to do either, right? As we would pray for those who are against us, not so easy to do either, right? Especially, I'll, I'll, yeah, we had some other presidents, you know, before we were in office that said, hey, pray for those leaders. That didn't always come out of my lips. Very hard. You're praying that, hey, maybe they'll get my uh, car or something, you know? Not really, but I mean, sometimes we have that and that we shouldn't have that as a believer, you know? We should say, hey, I want to see Nancy Pelosi get saved. That'd be amazing, right? Hard to say, hard to pray for, but same time, hey, I was just as bad as she was. I was just as bad. We, our sin separates us. 
We were sinners, spit in the face of our Lord, you know? So they're just without God. They're ignorant to the fact that they could have this, you know? Change their whole life, that'd be kind of cool, you know? Who knows? Maybe one day they will. But, yeah, that's, that's a hard deal. We have, that's the kind of love that Jesus had while he was on the cross for those who spat at him, those who hit him in the face, who plucked out his beard, who beat him, who nailed him that cross. He loved all of those, the, the, his own people who cried out, crucify him. I can't, I can't even fathom that kind of love. That's, that's tough. You know, usually our sphere is what? Our family. Yeah, man, okay. I'll do anything for my family, for my kids. I'll do whatever. But that's basically where it ends. You know, if you're honest. I mean, I am. But, I mean, it extends, but you know, I'm saying that deep love that Christ has for the lost, you know, how much love do you have if someone came and spit in your face? I love you, man. Give you a hug. I doubt it. Very seriously, you know, but that's what he's saying. Have these things that I taught you that we have, we have the entirety of Scripture that speaks of his love for us, for his people. And that is what Paul is reminding us, that be of those things, and have that love for one another, believers, even though sometimes they bug you, which we do, because why? We're human, and we're not perfect, so, and we're a little weird, so it's hard to do sometimes, and have that love for the lost, working out our salvation, not working for our salvation. You know, that's always a trippy, a trippy verse is work out your salvation. What? I thought it was finished on the cross. It's not what he's talking about. It's working out our salvation as Christ already did that work for salvation. And then us, it's like putting legs, putting feet to our faith, to our salvation, letting it be active in our lives, you know, not working to get there because that would never happen. Uh, Pastor David Gusick he wrote, uh, this is not to work their salvation in the sense of accomplishing it, but to work out their salvation, to see it evident in every area of their lives, to activate the salvation that God freely gave us. You know, that's what, that's what it's talking about. The, the finished work is done. We believe you're saved, salvation comes, it's a free gift to everybody. And then we just activate it in our life. Because of our salvation, we have that love for one another. You're not going to have love for one another or especially the lost or your enemy without God's saving grace, without salvation that we've attained that he gave for free. So that's what he's talking about in verse 12. Verse 13, it says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Kind of goes with the last verse. God is working in us and he pours in what we must pour out. That's that, that part of working it out. Be diligent, be motivated to do his will for his good pleasure. And like, like I said, it's not based on working anything. It should come out. He's pouring, the more we take into him, that's like that song said, you know, more of him, less of me, and more of him. Probably butchered it, right? But yeah, anyway. Yeah, you get what I'm saying. More, yeah. Anyway, the more that he, that if him is coming in, we can't help it but it comes out. We want to do those things. We want to love on people. We want to share. We want the lost to get saved, you know? And so it's him that's pouring in it. So that's what we want to see. He delights in working in and through us for the good news, to the good, to share that good news, to spread that good news of all mankind. He gives us the desire and the ability to do it. So we show God honor, obedience, reverence when we're doing those things that he purposes in our heart. He puts it in there, and then we act upon it, you know, if it's in your heart. It pours out. You can't help but do it. Verse 14, well, this would be 14 through 16. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, 
holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So complaining or murmuring is what that word is in the Greek. It means a secret debate, a secret displeasure not openly admitted. So you know, like, I can't stand that stupid stuff going on. I just, <clears throat> you just mumbling to yourself, you know, doing those things. That's, that's that murmuring. It is underneath, under your breath, complaining and complaining. You ever seen anybody of those, any of those people? No? Just me? Huh? You hear them? You just hear a little bit more. <laughs> Walking around, murmuring about, complaining about whatever. There's, people, there's some people I've known them out, complain about everything. Like, dude, just get away, man. You're just bringing me down. Like Debbie Downer, man. You know? Anybody else? Anybody guilty of that? Murmuring anywhere? Yeah? Yeah, let me see hands. No, I'm just kidding. Just, no. I've done it. I mean, everyone's done it. You know? Oh, yeah. And then you start complaining about it. Do all things... All things without complaining and disputing. Even washing the dishes, yep. We find ourselves complaining, arguing. That's what disputing is, arguing. And we need to ask ourselves, why are we doing the task? Why are we doing the work? Why are we serving? If we're going to murmur about it, who are we doing it for? You know, a lot of people, oh, I'll do it. And then you complain about it. Well, then don't do it. If that's what it's going to be. You know, even, even in, in service of the Lord, ministry, seeing it time and time again. People will do it. I'm like, what do you, who are you doing this for? Don't do it for the pastor. Hey, I need help. Oh, I'll help, pastor. Yeah, I'll help you. And then they're complaining about it. Well, we don't need your help. You know, do it as unto the Lord, not for the pastor. Don't do it for yourself, for that. If we do anything, and it says, do all things without complaining and disputing. So work, play, whatever it is, you know. Yeah, it sucks to work sometimes. You got to complain about it. You got a bum deal, whatever. Hard work. Yeah, but do as as to the Lord. Colossians 3.23, it says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So that makes it, puts it in a different frame of mind when we're doing those things. You know, you can just look at, oh man, just, just bugging me. I'll do it to the Lord. All right, Lord, I'm going to do it the best I can. I have a crappy job. Oh man, it's just, ugh, I hate. Maybe that's where the Lord's got you. You know, give it to him. Do it for him. Hey, maybe you got me here for a reason. Maybe to share, maybe to be a light in this, this place or to my horrible boss. Don't even say it, Bryson. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's, it's so they can get saved. You know, we don't know. It'd be nice if everyone had a great boss, and easy job, and we just make money, and you know, like everybody's doing now, working from home in their PJs, <laughs> on you know, a Zoom Zoom meeting. Oh, hi, nice shirt. You got PJs and slippers on. You got donut and coffee underneath the laptop. Pretty pretty chill. Boss isn't around. Pretty nice right now, actually. Wish I could do that, but I can't. But anyway, my point is, just don't be complainers. You know, don't be an arguer. You know, hey, we should, you know, I need to do this. Oh, we should do it this way. Maybe not. Maybe you should do it the way I asked you to do it. And not complain. Or don't do it. But be blameless also in, the, in these verses. Be blameless, pure, simple, justified, faultless in what we do. Because they're always, someone's always watching. Someone's always looking. You know, a lot, a lot of a Christian is who they are, their walk. Sometimes you may never say anything to anybody, and they're watching. There's like, something different about you. You know, you see a light, or, man, there's something different about that dude. I seen that guy at Sunday, and then I see him Monday at work. I don't know about that. He talks about church, but I don't know if he, where he's going. You know, so they're watching. Everyone's watching. So that we need to be blameless, not a complainer, pure, justified, faultless, you know. That's what we need to be. Not an easy task, not all the time, but we need to be. We need to let our light shine right now. And especially in those verses, let's say, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. 
I think we're there again, right? That we need to be a light. We need to illuminate our world. Right now, all they're seeing is just dark. You know, you look out there, there's no hope out there. So we, as Christians, who know the truth, who know, have the good news in our heart, we have that hope. We're going to be with him. You know, this, this world right here for the non-believer is as good as it's going to get. That's it. Wherever you're topping out, that's it. We have that hope. This isn't it. This isn't our home. We're passing through. You know, so we need to let that light shine. We need to shine bright so all can see who we represent, that beacon of hope. You know, it's like a lighthouse. You ever been out? I know Mike goes out in the ocean. And you've been out, out in the ocean, fog hits. Where did it land? You have this big light, like this one that's shining in my eyes. Giant light, right, on the coast. And you see that light. That's a beacon of hope for seafarers coming in, especially before GPS and all that stuff. That light shines so they can make their way back where it's the safe harbor. You know, so just like that, we need to be a beacon of hope. The church represents hope. We represent each one of us. So we have to let that light shine. Everywhere we go, that little bit of light can illuminate the darkness so people can see where we're, where we're going, where they can go. Take hold of the word. Man, stand on that. That's all we got. You know, I love it where the disciples, are you all going to leave? Where are we going to go? You got the words of life. Where else can we go? Where do you want to go? Once you know the truth, where else are you going to go? Anything better out there? I don't think so. I looked for nine years. I didn't find nothing. Try to fill it with hunting. Try to fill it with whatever. Nothing out there, you know. I even turned as far out as to start looking into the, the satanic Bible and going that way and checking the weird stuff out. There's nothing good out there. Nothing new under the sun. You know, there's definitely no hope going that way. There's no light being shined that way. You know, so especially now, today, stuff is happening so quickly. We're getting to the end, which is the beginning. But we need to stand, take hold of this word, like Paul's saying, be blameless, be pure. How are we going to do that? As we read the scriptures, as the Holy Spirit pours out more and more of him and less of us. Purge this stuff out. A lot of this gook in there. It takes a long time to get all that stuff out. You know what I'm saying? Well, Paul wants to make sure that, that they, the, the Philippians, he wants to make sure, hey, that they stay on track. He wants to make sure we stay on track. He wants to know that his work in Philippi wasn't in vain. You know, that he didn't run that race to just, what, it was over and I already ran? There's no prize? You know, I already got beat? No, he, he wants to know what he went there and preached that he can look back and say, no, they got it, okay, I can move forward. That, that way he knows that even he's in Rome, stuck, imprisoned, waiting for trial, that he wants to make sure, hey, the believers that I was there, set up, my friends, my brethren, they're all right. Stand there. Make sure you have all those boxes checked. Make sure you stand firm in the word. Stand close to our Lord. Have that mind to Christ because we don't want to get tripped up. We want to make sure that his work was fruitful, that us too, we want to make sure that we didn't run in vain while we're here. Verse 17 and 18 says, Yes, and if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Jeff got me that nice little table right here. I don't have to worry about it spilling. Uh, Paul, Paul's saying here that if he goes to his death, which he doesn't know yet at this point, he's there before Caesar, and he's waiting to get that trial. So if he goes to that death, like a drink offering, like being poured out on the altar, you know, they would pour out that drink offering upon the altar, sacrifice to God. That he wants to know, hey, if I'm, if I'm being poured out, he's being faithful to his calling. 
faithful to minister, strengthen their strength there at Philippi and here. As we know, the word speaks. It's live and active in our, in our lives, and it's still here, and it's speaking to us now as we read the Philippians that he was faithful to minister, that he strengthened their faith. Their faith. He's strengthening our faith. We see the things that Paul went through. Hey, we can do it. You know, dude was amazing, but he went through some stuff, you know, and it can encourage, it can encourage us. Hey, man, he's, we can be strengthened by that, that he wasn't even worried about his own life. He wasn't worried about anything that happened to him, that he was just going to continue on. So he wanted to make sure they knew that. If I'm going to be poured out, that he wanted to be sure he strengthened their faith. He wasn't afraid at all of the death. He wasn't full of sorrow, but he had joy. We, we see that throughout that, that be glad and rejoice with me. He's, he has joy that, hey, like I said before, it's a win-win. Caesar puts him to death, you're with the Lord. Let's him go, you're with your people. Win-win, he's still going. He's not afraid of that. He's not full of sorrow, but he's rejoicing. Rejoicing in the fact, if, if he's martyred, hey, that's good. He knows, he's good, that, that's fine then he would stand firm and he we wouldn't be put out, that he wouldn't be afraid of that that's coming. And he wanted to make sure the Philippians knew that, that, hey, don't, don't be all bummed, not being morbid, you know, that, oh, hey, rejoice in my death. That's weird. We, we, we loved you, you know. No, 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 not that. But just, hey, I know where I'm going. So be, re, be joyful about that. I'm going to be with the Lord. You guys are good. I'm good with it. Don't be bummed out because I'm, I'm not bummed. I'm good. And he was all settled in his heart. I'm fine with it. So rejoice with me. You know, don't weep. Don't be bummed out. But have that same joy that Paul is talking about that he's going through right now. And that we serve the Lord with an all-in frame of mind. Like Paul, that bond servant putting aside what we, we, we're about, and for him, Jesus, you know, standing for him whether in life or death, like Paul was doing. Either way is an acceptable sacrifice. You know, we don't know what's coming for any of us. You know, Paul didn't start every day like, oh, I wonder if I'm going to be killed tomorrow. I better not go. No, they even told him, hey, don't go some places. You're, you're going to be all, you're going to be jacked up. They're going to get you. Hey, Get out of the way, man, I'm going. It doesn't matter whether they bang me up. I'm going. The Lord is calling me to go. I'm going to go. So why be freaked out? You can't worry about it. He's like, nah, just do it. Death, life is good. Either way is an acceptable sacrifice. 19 through 22 says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. So Paul wants to send Timothy. Paul doesn't know when he's going to get out. So Timothy's there. He wants to send Timothy to Philippi. But he's also... I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy, not I'm just going to do it. You know, not, hey, tomorrow we're going to do this and this. No, nope. if the Lord wills, today might be it for all of us right here. We don't know. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So he's like, no, nah, I'm trust tr trusting in the Lord to send Timothy to you if that's his will. If it's not his will, then it won't happen. But that he would be encouragement to them, guys. Um, and Paul knew that Timothy was the right one to send because he had a heart of a pastor. He was with Paul doing those things. It was kind of like a father-son relationship. He took him under his wings, taught him. They served together. They did all those things. They traveled together. And he's like, Timothy and I say the same mind. We're all about this. I'm going to send him. Not that all those that were there, he said, I have no one else like-minded who would care for you that way. Not everyone has that mind or that heart of a pastor to care for the sheep, that shepherd's heart. You know, we're all believers. We're all going to be in the ministry, all do those things. But he's like, Timothy, we're just going to look after you like I will look after you. 
like sending you because that he knew that they were there. I mean, he knew that he was there for him always, that they served together. That, and he expected that if Timothy went, there wasn't going to be problems to report because, like I said, the, the Philippians were doing pretty good. They were, they were doing what they're supposed to do. They supported Paul. They looked after Paul. They sent material support to Paul that, but they needed to be encouraged because now hey, your guy's locked up. You know, we look, we look up to Paul, even though he's just a man, he's still that guy we look up to that he would be encouraged knowing that Timothy went caring for them, that he would report nothing but encouragement. So it's hard, hard to say why Paul didn't feel anyone else was there, but it was probably because of that heart for ministry. Like I said, the, the heart of a pastor, you can be involved in ministry all the time. I always say, Pastor Anthony, a dude is full of grace, mellow, graces. I'm like a bowl in a china cabinet. I don't have that grace. And Pastor Anthony just always, he just loves on people that not everyone's like that. I don't have that, you know, but there's some people that just truly have that no matter what. They're just like, man, you love everybody. And he knew that, man, he had that heart of a pastor to go there. And he'd be the one he could, he could rely on, that he, they were going to get what they needed to get with Timothy and not all the other guys. And also, we saw, as we read the text, the, read the, uh, through the scripture, we know Timothy was well spoken of. You know, they knew who Timothy was. They knew that his time in the ministry was with Paul. They knew who he was and, you know, that they were coming in. He was in one mind. They were in one mind, the mind of Christ, and Timothy would, would be all right. And when you send someone that they know, hey, they were, they were on board. Even Paul, when he first got saved, when he came, when the Lord, the Lord opened his eyes, literally, when he went in, they're like, whoa, wait a minute. We know this dude. That's the guy that kills Christians. Right? Then he started to speak, and they shared, hey, no, this guy, he made a, made a turn. So your reputation precedes you, good or bad. So they, know who, they knew who Timothy was. Verse 23 says, Therefore I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. So he didn't know what was going to go on for sure, you know, the present situation, what kind of issues were going to come up, that if that was even possible. I'm going to see what happens with me. Maybe Paul, hey, maybe I'm going to need him with me. Maybe I'm going to need him to minister to me. So he said, hang on. You know, there might be some deals here. We'll see how it goes with me. But I'm trusting the Lord also that I may come. Because Paul wanted to go. So he said, but hey, maybe, maybe I'll be able to come out there shortly to you as well. So whatever issues that were going on, wait and see, see what happens. Uh, and he wanted to see them face to face, but he knew whatever the Lord had, you know, the Lord's will. I want to go, but I know if the Lord has something else, if the Lord has this for me, that I'll suffer and be martyred, then so be it. If he lets me out, so be it. We'll see. I'm going to trust in the Lord for that, and we'll, we'll see what happens when it happens. 25 and 26. <laughs> It says, yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger, and the one who ministered to my needs since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard he was sick. So it was better, Epaphroditus, he went, he, he was the one that brought support from them. They gathered it in the Philippian church. They gathered support for him, for Paul, sent Epaphroditus over there. He got there got sick. So it was better that they would send Epaphroditus back, even though he was ministering to Paul. Hey, go back. The brethren at Philippi, they're worried, they're concerned because you almost died, you know, so better to go back, strengthen them. See, they're Paul again. You know, hey, I'd love to have you here. We're a brother. We're talking. You came all this way. You brought me support because Philippi is over here. Rome's way over here. It's a journey. And Paul said, no, go back. 
to the brethren. And don't worry about me. Go back. You've, you've done enough here. I want you to go back. It's better for you to return to the brethren at Philippi to ease their worry, ease their concern. He was sick almost to death. And he wanted to return back to his brethren, to the place he served. And he'd been, he'd been gone for a long time. And you get back to your church and your people you're with, people that are in ministry, you get back, right back in and roll your sleeves. You want to go back. You know, your vacation or whatever, or sick and gone for a while, and you come back. It's nice to be back in there. We were gone for what? Amy was going through her stuff. We we're gone, what? End of, end of October, and we just came back end of February, March, whenever it was. That's a long time. I mean, I've been here for 20 something years in this church. And yeah, you're missing guys. Had some people come over and visit, but everyone's here. You want to go back. You long for that. Even Amy, when she wasn't here, her, her counts weren't good yet. I, need, I don't care what's going on. I need to get back in the church. I need to get back in fellowship. I want to see everybody. That's the same thing. Returning back. I want to, I got to get back there. You know, it's my brothers, my sisters. It's who we serve with, you know. And that's where, that's where Epaphroditus' heart was. So Paul's like, go. It's better. Ease their worry. Ease their concern that you were almost dead, go back. So that's what Paul wanted to do, to encourage them as he encouraged himself. 27 says, For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and did not, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So Epaphroditus, it doesn't say what happened, but he got there, got sick, almost to death while he was in Rome with Paul. So naturally, they were concerned. If someone gets sick here, you know, in our, in our fellowship, we have some concern for them. Hey, we got to pray for them. Are they okay? What's going on? You know, not that we're freaked out, but hey, we have concern, true concern. Why? Because we love those people. You know, pray God does a miracle. Pray God heals them. That's what they were, that's what they were talking about. And he was sick unto death. They're like, man, we sent him out there. Now he goes all the way to Rome. He might die. We might not ever see him again when they heard that. So there was that concern, not that true worry, but just a concern for his health. But the Lord had mercy on him. It doesn't say miraculously or just went through the sickness and got better. He allowed him to, to live. Paul did all kinds of miracles. Not this time. So weird. What, what, what? So God heals some, heal, doesn't heal some? Yeah. Paul could have done it, but it wasn't that time. So somehow, wasn't miraculous, or may have been, doesn't say, but he was healed. So he's back up. Paul wants to send him back. He had mercy on him, and also Paul says, on me. So because he, he saw Aphroditus, or Epaphroditus, came, bringing him support. He, Paul, yeah, how awesome. Brought me encouragement, brought me support, and now the guy's going to die. Bummer, man. That's, the guy came and helped me out. And that, so Paul's like, I'm, I'm in prison, all this thing, and now I'm going to have even more sorrow? No. But he had mercy, mercy upon him as well by that. And if the Lord needs us here, we're bulletproof until, he, until he's done with us. You know, I was talking with Hank the other day, and if you guys don't know, Hank was hit by a semi how many years ago, on his motorcycle, you know, was talking back and forth. And my Lord wasn't done with you, man. You know, there's only probably one Hank in the world. And until the other one's born, you got to be here. You know, the guy was in the emergency lane, gets hit by a semi, and he's here today. You know, so that was amazing. Like, you're bulletproof until the Lord's done with you. You know, I didn't say, I mean, it was a mess. Yeah. Air life, never seen anybody like that that lived. Like, yeah, how many people get hit by a semi and make it? You know, bike was thrashed and crazy. Anyway, hospital, all that stuff. He's here. The Lord wasn't done with him yet, or else he wouldn't be here. So, you know, not to test the Lord, not to, to do that, but we're bulletproof until he's, he's done with us. So, and we see, what's that? Yeah, no, it didn't say there could be a lot of stuff going on, but yeah, 
You may be fine now, but you may be in a different capacity, but he still may need you here. But we see that Paul says the Lord had mercy. He had mercy on Epaphroditus. He had mercy on himself to recover in that, you know, that, that heart again, like I said, heart of a servant, that heart of our Lord is putting others before ourselves, you know. If you're locked up, bummer. Even though Paul had that freedom to, to preach, to go have visitors, do what he wanted, he was still waiting trial. He was still there with Caesar. He had a guard with him all the time. That's a kind of a reminder that you're not truly free, you know. But he was like, no, nah, it's more, you go, encourage the brethren, go back, more needful for you. Just like he was saying, I go be with the Lord, that's awesome, but maybe more needful for me to stay to encourage, to help, to minister to you guys. So 28 through 30, we're going to finish. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. So, most likely Epaphroditus, as soon as he was healed up and and ready to go, Paul sent him on his way. Hey, head on back. Go bring joy back to the brethren. Encourage them and it will encourage me. You know, relieve their hearts for that pain they have and that, you know, that you were almost dead. But go back and be with them, their fellow worker in the faith, you know, that they will know, hey, he's back. All right, cool, man. He can be returned to us, strengthens us, brings us that that joy that we have. Hey, all right. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be good. It's gonna be all right. That he's saying also that he has that heart for the work of the Lord. He has that bond servant heart, Epaphroditus. He took all that you needed and he, he hey I'll take it. I'll go. Those journeys back then, that wasn't easy, not just jumping the car, driving a bin, you know. They had to cross seas. They had to go through crazy parts, walking here and there through the deserts, through, uh, what do they call those guys? I don't know, burglars. What do they call them guys on the side of the road? Anyway, there you go. Highway, highway men. All that kind of stuff. It wasn't just easy driving and heading out and bringing support. Here you go, man. Cool, thanks. Or... We'll just send it to you, send you a check, send you a thing, whatever. That he went, hey, I'll, I'm not going to worry about it. I got to go. I'm going to go encourage Paul. Let me bring it and let me do it. So Epaphroditus, he's saying, what? These guys were good, but he's saying you're lack, what you were lacking, Epaphroditus completed. So they brought it. They collected the support, and Epaphroditus completed that part, that, that completed service, put the finishing touches on him. They had it, and he brought it to Paul without concern for himself. So that was the completion of their work, their support. It wasn't like, hey, you're lacking in your service towards me. But that was the part, hey, he completed. You brought it, he finished it, put the cap on. We're good. He ministered to us. So, and through that, we see through the, the, this chapter is just the heart of Paul towards the brethren, the heart of Having that heart of Christ, that mind of Christ, the whole through Philippians is one mind, is being one-minded, Christ-like, Christ-minded, that we would have that bondservant heart, that mind of a bondservant, putting others above us, you know, doing that, putting Christ above all else, and then knowing, hey, he's, he is the Lord, he is God. So let us not be satisfied in our service until it's complete, like like the Philippian church, doing it, hey, until we're done, until we're out of here, it's not complete. So continue on, continue the race. Be of one accord, be of one mind. See, you guys have never heard that joke before? The accord, when I talked to you last time? I can't believe that. Weird. Never heard apostles in one accord? Tried it last week, I tried it again. No, nothing. All right. I'm going to find out who said it. Anyway, wasn't, wasn't funny last week. Wasn't funny this week. I'm going to keep saying it every time until you guys, like, oh, hey, okay, I get it. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, okay, see, never mind. Thought I'd, thought I'd throw it in there. Yeah, so be of one accord all together, okay, there you go. But be of that one mind, a Christ mind, a Christ, Christ-like, that we would be that humble heart, that bond-servant heart, not only looking out for us, but for others, you know, for others' interests. And let us not be complainers, grump murmurers, right? Holding fast to the word. That's what Paul's saying. Do these things. Be these things. Let us wholly trust in the Lord and let us put on the mind of Christ. Amen? Lord God, we just thank you for just another day. Thank you for just speaking to us through your word, Lord. Just thank you knowing that you are the Lord. You are God, Father, and you are the one who forgives us our sins and that we trust in you. We love you, Lord. We just ask that you would just help us to spread that good news, to be that hope, to be that beacon of light, like a lighthouse, Lord, guiding us into that safe harbor so that others will see and know that uh, you are who you say you are and that uh, there is life after this. So we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.